Pills actually did look different than others in the bottle. Officials here say right. if anyone has taken a cyanide laced Tylenol capsule, well, they probably wouldn't be able to make it to the phone to call. Several people in the Chicago area had died after taking Tylenol. And it all starts with 12 year old Mary Kellerman, who woke up at 6 30 on September 29th, 1982, feeling sick, feeling like she had a cold. To help to combat the symptoms of her cold, her father, Dennis, decided to give her some Tylenol. And just a few minutes after Mary took the Tylenol, Dennis heard her walk into the bathroom and shut the door. Just a few seconds after that, he heard a loud thud and he ran over to the door, asked her if she was okay. She didn't respond, so he opened the door. And when he did, he found Mary unresponsive and convulsing on the bathroom floor. Of course, they called 911 right away and then she was rushed to the hospital and doctors tried to resuscitate her, but unfortunately it was too late. Mary was gone. No one could explain her sudden death. Nothing unusual appeared in the autopsy and doctors just thought she had an unexplained sudden cardiac arrest. There was really no reason to suspect the Tylenol had anything to do with her death. And because she was so young, the medical examiner thought he should check in with her father, Dennis, and just make sure that her parents' stories checked out. So police officers went to their home and everything appeared normal. So then just a few hours later, that same day around noon, 27-year-old postal worker, Adam Janice, who is from Arlington Heights, decided he was going to stay home from work that day because he wasn't feeling well. He also thought maybe he was getting a cold. Later that afternoon, he went and picked up his kids from preschool, and then he brought them to the grocery store to pick up some Tylenol. When he got home, he made lunch for his kids, and then he took two extra strength Tylenol. And right away, he tells his wife, Teresa, that he is not feeling well. But shortly after taking the Tylenol, he collapsed and started convulsing. 911 was called and Adam was rushed to the nearby Northwest Community Hospital. And when he got there, doctors were unable to resuscitate him and he was pronounced dead at 3.15 p.m. When they got back to the house, it was about 5 p.m. and all of them were exhausted and totally shocked. And his little brother, Stanley, wasn't feeling so good. And he was also married to a woman named Teresa. She felt like she had a headache kind of coming on, especially because she had been crying a bunch at the hospital. So they both decided to take Tylenol. It was extra strength Tylenol that was sitting out on the counter from when Adam had taken it. Stanley was first to take it, and then Teresa took it just a few minutes later. Stanley was the first to pass out. Meanwhile, at the hospital, the doctor who had just worked on Adam and was trying to figure out what had happened there gets alerted by a nurse that the Janice family is coming back in. So they come in within hours of Adam being pronounced dead and they're having the exact same symptoms. Of course, that's when they started thinking that the three of them must have consumed something the same thing, whatever it was, and that maybe they were poisoned. But poisoning wasn't something that they had ever dealt with before, so they called the Rocky Mountain Poison and Drug Safety Center. And they suggested that the three of them had possibly died as a result of cyanide poisoning. So they sent off some blood samples to a local lab for testing. Meanwhile, an off-duty firefighter named Philip Capitelli from the Arlington Heights Fire Department had heard both of these calls come in through his police scanner, and he thought it was super strange. Now, Mary had been taken to another hospital, so that's why the two hospitals hadn't connected on the fact that all of these victims had taken Tylenol, but once they figured that out, it seemed pretty obvious. They also found that both bottles of Tylenol had the same lot number, MC2880. And after the chief toxicologist examined the pills more closely, he realized that some of the pills actually did look different than others in the bottle. Some of them were bigger and the powder inside the larger pills was kind of clumpy. And by the time he had access to the pills, the cyanide began to eat away at the capsule's exterior and it made it way more obvious that they had been tampered with than when they originally looked. So then the chief medical examiner said to smell both bottles. And that's when they figured out that both bottles had a slight smell of almond. And this is really interesting. Only 50% of the population is able to detect this almond smell, but apparently cyanide smells like almonds. And that theory was confirmed later on when the test results came back and showed that there was indeed 
cyanide in both bottles. Mary, Adam, Stanley, and Teresa had all been poisoned by cyanide. And unfortunately, these four were not the only people killed that day. Mary Lynn Rayner was a 27-year-old mother living in Winfield, Illinois, which is just about 25 minutes south of Arlington Heights. September 29th, 1982 was the first day that she had been released from the hospital after giving birth to her fourth child just a few days earlier. When she got home, she took two extra strength Tylenol and within just a few minutes, she collapsed on the floor and her husband, Ed, called 911 immediately. Mary officially died the following morning at 9.30 a.m. Then there was another Mary, Mary McFarland. It's strange that three of these victims were named Mary. Mary McFarland was from Lombard County and she worked at the Bell Phone Center in Yorktown Mall. And while she was at work that day, she started to feel a headache coming on. So of course, what did she do? She took some extra strength Tylenol. And just a few minutes after consuming the Tylenol, she also collapsed to the ground right in front of her co-workers and started convulsing. She was rushed to the Good Samaritan Hospital in Downers Grove and got there around 7.20 p.m. and spent hours in critical condition before she was pronounced dead at 3.15 a.m. She was only 31 years old and was the single mother of two boys, which is incredibly sad. Then that same day, September 29th, Paula Prince, who was a 35-year-old flight attendant with United, also consumed some Tylenol after landing at the O'Hare Airport in Chicago. It was about 9.30 p.m. when she purchased it, and she didn't even have a chance to get to the hospital. She was alone when she died, so no one was able to call 911. And because the these victims all died in different places and with different medical teams. It was not connected right away that this was from Tylenol. It wasn't until Northwest Community Hospital got the lab results back that they ended up contacting the other hospitals and were able to find out about the other victims. In 1958, Johnson & Johnson acquired McNeil Laboratories and McNeil Consumer Products were responsible for manufacturing prescription containing acetaminophen, which is the active ingredient in Tylenol. When Johnson & Johnson acquired McNeil, they began promoting a new over-the-counter pain reliever called Tylenol back in the 60s. And because they were the only brand to sell this type of product back then, they controlled the market. And by the early 1980s, Tylenol had over 100 million users. Of course, it wasn't long until word got back to Tylenol and they realized they had a real crisis on their hands. That morning on the 30th, there was a press conference held going over the victims' names and how they had all taken Tylenol. The press conference was at 8 a.m. and by 9.15 a.m., most of the stores in the greater Chicago area had completely removed Tylenol from their shelves. Some stores were more cautious and removed them all, but a lot of people thought that it was just that batch that had been tampered with. And of course, people were totally freaked out. And not just in Chicago, people were freaked out across the entire country. People were calling up the poison control hotline over and over to the point where they were just ringing off the hook. And of course, Johnson & Johnson hopped on this immediately. One of their attorneys went right to the medical examiner's office to learn more. Their reaction was, how do we save lives as quickly as possible? And if possible, how do we save this product? We were always going to be judged on, on, on how we responded to it. That first day, September 30th, when the news went public, they were under the impression that it really was contained to just Chicago. So they told retailers in the rest of the country that they were fine to keep Tylenol on their shelves. By 3 p.m. that day, Johnson & Johnson released an official recall of all Tylenol products from lot number MC2880. But even though they tried telling the public that just that lot number was tampered with, of course, people weren't gonna take the chance and nobody felt safe taking Tylenol or giving it to their kids. So their market share dropped to 7% overnight. Soon, Johnson & Johnson got word of the other deaths that had been caused after taking Tylenol. And that's when they realized that Mary Reiner's bottle was from lot number 1833 MB. And so they expanded the recall to Tylenol bottles that had that lot number as well. But the recall expanded even further on October 1st when Paula Prince's body was discovered and investigators learned that her Tylenol had a different lot number on it. 
Hers was from 1801 MA. That night, October 1st, 1982, at 11 p.m., Mayor Jane Byrne had a press conference and told the public that no person should consume Tylenol in any form, no matter the lot number. And it was also stated during this press conference that Johnson & Johnson was not responsible for what had happened. Johnson & Johnson had to recall 31 million bottles of Tylenol on October 5th, which is the equivalent of $100 million worth of product. The production of Tylenol completely halted and the advertisement of Tylenol stopped as well. In fact, Johnson & Johnson put out paid advertising against the consumption of their product. More than 10 million recalled bottles were tested and a total of 50 pills were laced Five of those bottles belonged to the deceased victims, two bottles had been sent back laced, and one bottle had yet to be sold. Johnson & Johnson offered people safe replacement capsules for the bottles that they recalled, and they also put out a $100,000 reward for anyone who had information about who did this and why. And by October 5th, the attorney general and the FBI were both working on this case. Officials here say right. if anyone has taken a cyanide laced Tylenol capsule, well, they, they probably wouldn't be able to make it to the phone to call. It, they... So the recall was very effective. There were no other Tylenol related deaths reported, but now they had to figure out who did this and why would they want to do this? He had no clues as to the motivation except the taking of human life. Police are looking for disgruntled employees, angry customers, anybody with a grudge against the stores or Tylenol. They were able to rule out that they had actually laced the pills inside the manufacturing plant, but they knew that whoever did lace the pills had gotten bottles from different stores. Whoever did it laced 50 pills, put them into different bottles, and then put them back on the store shelves. And because cyanide quickly eats away at the capsule itself, it was determined that whoever put them on the shelves had to have worked very quickly. And they had to be put on the shelves about 48 hours or less from when they were consumed. Then on October 6th, just a day after the nationwide recall of all Tylenol products, an unsigned extortion letter was sent to the manufacturer, threatening to repeat all these killings unless he was wired $1 million. And the letter provided an account number for the money to be sent to. This letter was immediately sent to the FBI and they determined that it was written by a man named James Lewis. And it wasn't till December of that year that James was spotted at a New York library. He was arrested and brought into custody. But after they investigated James a little further, it became obvious that he was not the perpetrator of the original attack. Also, it was determined that the account number that James had put on the letter didn't even belong to him. It actually belonged to a man named Frederick McKay, who James was angry at because he believed he conned his wife out of 500 bucks. So he was hoping that he could pin the Tylenol poisonings on him and that the FBI would go after him. It was determined that he was not the Tylenol killer. Suspect number two, Roger Arnold. That year on October 9th, Roger was at an Irish pub in Lincoln Park where he made comments about being the killer. He was literally at the pub whipping out a baggie of white powder and showing it off to people, telling them that it was cyanide and that he was the one who committed the attack. He was held without bail so that they could question him about the Tylenol attack. And he tried to tell them that he did have cyanide in his home that he used for special projects, but he had gotten rid of it after the Tylenol attack. Eventually, they had to clear Arnold as a suspect because there was not enough evidence connecting him to the crime. Eventually, though, they did come up with another suspect. And you guys might be familiar with this suspect, Ted Kaczynski, otherwise known as the Unabomber. From 1978 to 1996, Ted was responsible for killing three and injuring 23 individuals. And he was considered a suspect because his first attacks took place in Chicago. But from the beginning, Ted denied any involvement in the Tylenol case. No one has ever been identified for killing these seven people. This whole event, of course, triggered major changes in the way that consumer products are packaged. Johnson & Johnson knew that the trust wasn't lost with Tylenol itself. It was the packaging of Tylenol 
that had lost their trust. Six weeks after the deaths occurred, Johnson & Johnson held a press conference and announced new and improved packaging that was gonna be guaranteed to help regain the trust that they had lost. Hello, safety seals. They became the leaders in this type of tamper-proof packaging. So they definitely got the trust of the public back. The handling of this crisis was so effective that their stock price went back up 25% within a year. In 1983, Congress passed the Tylenol Bill, which made it a federal offense to tamper with consumer products. And in 1989, the FDA established federal guidelines that required manufacturers to make all consumer products tamper proof. In 1991, the families of the victims ended up suing Johnson & Johnson for not already having that packaging in place. They argued that before this even happened, there were over 300 complaints about packaging being tampered with. But instead of going to court, Johnson & Johnson settled for an undisclosed amount. And like I said, to this day, the killer has not been identified, which is crazy. And one thing that I found so interesting about this case is that the doctors said that if three family members didn't die on the same day after consuming the same Tylenol, they would not have probably made the connection for a while and more people could have died. Anyway, that is it for me today, guys. I hope you found this case interesting. I certainly did. I hope you're having a great day. Stay safe out there and I will see you next time.